Uh, the first thing we're going to do in preparation for test three is to prove Lagrange's theorem. And I'm assuming that you know what cosets are. And uh, of course, read over all of the notes in the handout, handout number four, all of the notes, all of the examples that we did. But we'll do the major proofs over in these review videos. So Lagrange's theorem tells us that if G is a finite group and H is any subgroup of G, that the order of H divides the order of G. So to prove that, we're going to look at the set of cosets of H. And we're going to show that the set of cosets partitions the group. And once we show that, if we show that each coset has exactly the same number of elements in it as H does, then we know that the order of H divides the order of G. So let's, let's do that now. So given two cosets of H, we know that AH is intersect BH is either empty or it's not empty. So let's assume that, there, that it is not empty. Let's assume this and say, uh, suppose there is an x in AH intersect BH. x is in both of them. Well, that means that x is equal to A times some element of H, and it's also equal to B times perhaps some other element of H, BH2, which means that A is equal to B, H2, H1 inverse. Well, that tells us that AH then is equal to B, H2, H1 inverse, H. But we know that if the element comes from H itself, in other words, HH, capital H, is simply H. So we know here that this is equal to BH. So if, if the intersection is non-empty, in other words, there's some X in G that belongs in two cosets, then those cosets are exactly the same. So we know that either AH intersect BH is empty or they are identical. So let's write that down. Therefore, AH equals BH for any A and B and G. AH is equal to BH or AH and BH have nothing in common. Whoops, excuse me, is equal to, is equal to the empty set. So this means that they, the cosets form a partition. Let's write that down. The cosets of H partition, partition G since we, we know that the union of all the cosets is equal to G. So if you put them all together, you take the union you get all of G, but they are pairwise disjoint. So let me put A and G here. So the cosets of a subgroup form a partition of the group. So now I would like to show that the order of any coset is equal to the order of the subgroup itself. So Let's prove that the order of the coset, any coset, is equal to the order of the subgroup. Well, in order to prove that two sets have the same number of elements, we want to just form a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence between the two. So let's define phi mapping H to one of its cosets AH by uh, phi of little h will map to A times little h. It's a natural mapping. And phi is clearly one to one because if 
phi of uh, if phi of h1 is equal to phi of h2, then that means that a h1 is equal to a h2, and we're in a group multiplied on the left by a inverse, and we have h1 is equal to h2. So phi is a one-to-one -one mapping from h to a h. And clearly, by the definition of the map, clearly phi is onto the coset a h. Therefore, we can conclude that the order of h is the same as the order of any one of its cosets. Now g is a finite group, so of course uh, the order of h is finite and there are a finite number of cosets. So let's say that there are, uh, there are k cosets. So we, we could say, you know, we have a set of cosets, h, or we could call it eh, or h, and we could say a1h, a2h, up to a sub k minus 1h. So there are k cosets. And we know that g is the union from, these are distinct cosets, the union from Hmm, I, let me call this, uh, I should have called it, well, let's just put the union of all the cosets. And the order of them all is the same. So we have k cosets, and that would mean that the order of g is equal to k times the order of h. Or we say the index of h in g is equal to k. There are k left cosets of the subgroup H. Now you could put it on pause here and see if you can do problems 1 through 8. These are the kinds of problems that just test you specifically on an understanding of Lagrange's theorem. Um, I am going to do for you um, I think I will do number number one. Number two, if G is a finite group and the order of G mod N, well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. Sorry, in, in the handout we hadn't gotten to the factor group yet, but this just means, as you know, because we've gone past that now, that there are, um, that there are six cosets. What do you know about the order of G? Well, clearly, it's going to be a multiple of 6. Prove that if A is in G, then the order of A divides the order of G. I'm going to do that one. Let G be a group of order 60. What are the possible orders for the subgroups? Well, that'll be the divisors of 60. 5. Suppose K is a proper subgroup of H, and H is a proper subgroup of G. Well, let's do that one. I'll do number 5. Um, number six, I'll do. Number seven, um, why don't we, well, I'll do number seven. And number eight, suppose H and K are subgroups of the group G. The order of H is 12. The order of K is 35. Find the order of the intersection. Well, you know that the intersection is also a subgroup. And so the order of the intersection is going to divide both 12 and 35, and it has no common divisors other than 1. So the order here of H intersect K is 1. It's just the trivial subgroup containing only the identity. So you write out all of these and make sure that you can do these problems. Um, and now I'll do 1, 3, 5, 6, and 7. Number one, a group of prime order is cyclic. So we'll let the order of G be P, where P is a prime, and uh, let A be an element of G, A not equal to the identity. Well, let's look at the cyclic subgroup generated by A. The cyclic subgroup generated by A is a subgroup of G. So we know that the order 
of the cyclic subgroup generated by A divides the order of G, but the order of G is prime. Now A was not the identity, so that must mean that the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by A is equal to P. But the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by A, of course, is the order of A is equal to P. Um, we, in fact, you could just, right here, you can just say, therefore, G is equal to, is, is cyclic and generated by A. So Lagrange's theorem is what we use to prove that. Number three is almost an identical proof. The order of A divides the order of G. Well, this is like a one-sentence proof. The order of A is equal to the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by A. If you don't see why, then write out what is the cyclic subgroup generated by A. Uh, and, of course, we're assuming G is a finite group here, or we wouldn't be talking about divisibility. So, uh, and the order of the cyclic subgroup by Lagrange's theorem divides the order of G by Lagrange, let's say by LT. Therefore, the order of A divides the order of G. The order of any element is simply the number of elements in its cyclic subgroup generated by it. And so we know now that the order of every element divides the order of the group. Number, uh, number five gives us K is a proper subgroup of H, which is a proper subgroup of G. K has 42 elements in it, and G has 420. So we see here that the order of K times 10 is equal to the order of G. And H is somewhere in between the two. H is another subgroup, so we know that the order of H must divide 420. So either the order of H is equal to 2 times the order of K, 10 is 2 times 5, or the order of H is equal to 5 times the order of K. Because, because of the factor of 10 here. So 2 times the order of k would be, what, 84. And 5 times the order of k would be 210. So these are the possible orders of h. This is just little exercises to make sure you understand what Lagrange's theorem tells us. Number six, we have another finite group G, and we want to show that if you take any element of G and raise it to uh, the order of G power, you always get the identity. For example, in D4, the order of D4 is 8. And if you take any one of the elements of D4 and raise it to the 8th power, you're always going to get the identity. So check that out. Make sure you know what this says. And proving it is, is pretty easy. Uh, let's say that the order of A is equal to a number K. And we know from the prior two problems that K divides the order of G. So in other words, the order of G is equal to K times N for some natural number N. So let's look at A to the order of g power. That's a to the kn, which would be a to the k raised to the n, which is, well, the order of a was k. So that's e to the n is equal to e. Number seven, the order of the group is 15. It has one subgroup of order 5 and one subgroup of order 3. Prove that G is cyclic. Whenever you want to prove a group is cyclic, you need to find a generator. 
And so, well, we know it has a subgroup of order 5, so we know that it has, uh, well, let's just say the order of H is equal to 5, and let's make up a name for the one of order 3. And there's a subgroup K with order 3. Well, the order of both H and K is prime. They're prime numbers, so we know from a prior problem that H is cyclic. So H is generated by some number, some uh, element of G, and 3 is prime, so K is cyclic, and it's generated by some element B. So let's look at a, a likely candidate for generating the whole thing would be AB. So we're wondering at this point, is this equal to G? That's what we'd like to show that it is. So let's just think about the possibilities for the order of AB. The order of AB is a divisor of 15, so it would have to be 1, or it could be 3, or 5, or 15. And that's what we're hoping for there, because then it would be a generator of the whole group. Well, let's just cancel out these three other possibilities. If the order of AB was equal to 1, that would mean that AB is equal to the identity, which would tell us that A is equal to B inverse. But the order of an element is the same that would mean that the order of A was equal to the order of B inverse, which of course is equal to the order of B, and that's not true. So this is impossible. So now let's say, well, if the order of AB was equal to 3, then we know that we only have one subgroup of order 3, so AB would generate the same subgroup as a did. Now if AB generates the same subgroup as A, then either AB, this would tell us that either AB is A or AB is equal to A squared, because both A and A squared would generate that subgroup of order 3. Oh gosh, excuse me, this is... Uh, K is generated by B, so sorry you guys, this has to be B. B was the element of order 3. Okay, so if AB is equal to B, that's impossible because that would mean that A was the identity. And we know that uh, that's not true. A is of order 5. And if AB was equal to B squared, then A is equal to B, and that's an impossibility because they have different orders, so that's not possible. And our last case that we want to eliminate would be that the order of AB is equal to 5. And uh, this, you can go through the different cases. B, uh, no, A generates a subgroup of order 5, and so does A squared, A cubed, a to the fourth, they all generate that same subgroup. So if this were true, we would get the fact that AB is equal to some, some power of A. K equals uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. And uh, each of these will lead you to a contradiction because the order of A to the K is 5. And if we this would give us that b is a to the k minus 1. Any, pow any, any element in that cyclic subgroup generated by a has order 5, and b has order 3. So this is impossible, and therefore the order of a, b is equal to 15, which tells us that g is cyclic, and it's generated by a, b.